Good evening. Good evening, there, um, everyone. My name is um, Ron Peru. I'm the project manager here in um, for the Safford Field Office here in Safford, Arizona. Um, I'm going to be turning it over to Amelia Taylor um, here to do do a welcome. Go ahead, Amelia. Thanks, Ron. As Ron said, I'm Amelia Taylor. I'm an assistant field manager here at the Safford Field Office, and we wanted to welcome you and thank you for joining us this evening for the Chuparosa Solar Variance Public Meeting. Um, for this meeting, we do have the applicant for the project here <clears throat> to give you a presentation of the project along with BLM subject matter experts to answer any questions you may have as well. And we really encourage you to engage in this phase of the public participation for the Chuparosa project so that we can hear any thoughts or concerns you have as we move along in the process for this. So with that, thank you again. We, we appreciate your participation and I'm gonna turn it over to Selena. Good evening all. I'm Selena Martinez, a project manager with BLM Arizona. I assist our renewable energy lead, Derek Eisenbach, with variance, the variance process on incoming renewable energy applications. Derek couldn't attend this meeting this evening, but you will see his contact information on the slide presented. I also wanted to point out Ron Peru, who um, opened the meeting tonight, and he is the um, renewable energy project manager for the Safford Field Office. This meeting will present the proposed Chuparosa solar project um, put forth by Primergy. Please note the e-planning website, Safford Field Office postal address, and Safford Field Office solar email address. These are all various methods for you to submit comments. This information will also be shown on the next slide, and we will also drop the e-planning website in the chat. All right, as Amelia mentioned, um, there are some folks here from both uh, Safford Field Office and the Gila District Office. I wanted to be sure to call your attention to these folks. Um, and I will also set some ground, ground rules for how we're gonna proceed with the meeting. So um, any of these specialists will, will be here. I believe they're all on the call this evening and they will be able to help answer any resource specific questions that you may have um, or comments that may arise. And let's see, we also have, as Amelia mentioned, the applicant primer G and their representatives, along with the consultant SWCA, who will present the Chuparosa project and answer any questions related to what they are proposing, the technology or related research that has been completed to date. Before turning it over to Primer-G and SWCA, let me give a brief overview of the variance process and ground rules for this meeting. Solar energy generation is one of the many multiple uses that are allowed on BLM land. All of the approved uses on BLM land are laid out in the resource management plans for each field office. One of the steps in evaluating solar projects is to go through this variance process. This process is laid out in the Western, Western Solar Plan, also known as the Solar PEIS, which came out in 2012 and addresses how solar will be managed on BLM land in six Western states. That include Arizona, California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, and Colorado. This plan designated areas appropriate for solar development. These areas are called solar energy zones. There were also other areas excluded from solar energy development that are deemed to have more significant resource concerns, such, such as national conservation lands, wilderness areas, wilderness study areas, wild scenic river corridors, areas of critical environmental concern, areas having topography with steeper slope grades and other factors totaling 32 exclusion, exclusion criteria. Areas that haven't been mentioned are determined to be solar variance areas, which might be appropriate for solar development, but require extra due diligence check to ensure that the proposed project complies with the resource management plan. Preliminary research on the applicant's part is also required as a sort of desktop analysis to provide a briefing to BLM state and national leadership to determine whether the proposed project can proceed into NEPA. This is essentially the solar variance process. In this slide, you could see where we are in the process. There will be a 
30 day window from today to get comments in. So that'll close on August 21st. Any comments received will be compiled and included in the briefing package that gets presented to state and national leadership for concurrence this fall. If concurrence is granted, the project will then proceed into NEPA, which will ultimately lead to a decision on the project. If the project does go into NEPA, you will have an opportunity to be involved in scoping, the scoping process, and comment on draft and final analyses. At the end of this evening's presentation, we will open the floor for Q&A. Please hold your questions until the end. You can either present your questions in the chat box or by raising your hand. For those unfamiliar with Zoom, there's a ribbon at the bottom of your screen with various buttons. There's a reaction button with a smiley face on it. If you click that, you will see the raise hand button. To access the chat, click on the chat button in the bottom ribbon, and that'll open the chat window. If you raise your hand, feel free to come off mute when you are called on. We will also accept written comments, either via postal mail or email. Please note that this is a public meeting and it is being recorded. If you do not wish to speak or come on camera, you are invited to submit your comments in writing. and They will become part of the public record. All right, Primer G, I'll go ahead and stop screen sharing, hand it over to you, and you can introduce yourself and proceed with the presentation. Great, thank you, Selena. Mm -hmm. Right, can everyone see the presentation? We can see it. Perfect. Let's get the start situated. Okay. Hello and good afternoon. Thank you all for taking the time out of your schedule to listen to our presentation on our tuberosis to learn storage project. My name is Christina Casares, and I'm the developer on the project from Primer G Solar. Also joining me on the, on the call today is our consultant, Megan Dugan from SWCA. Primer G Solar is a developer of several utility scale solar and storage projects in North America. The team has collectively constructed and managed over two gigawatts of solar assets and possesses the technical capability to construct, operate, maintain, and decommission the project. Primer G Solar is a portfolio company of Quinbrook Infrastructures, which we can discuss further on the next slide. As mentioned, Primer G Solar is a wholly owned subsidiary of Quinbrook Infrastructure, a specialist investment manager focused on exclusively, focused exclusively on low carbon infrastructure investments. Quinbrook operates in the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia, and has invested more than 28 billion in 19 and in 19 gigawatts of energy infrastructure assets with a focus on utility scale, solar, wind, and battery storage. Primergy's development portfolio is shown on this map. We are active in 16 states across the country. The black sunbursts show our operating and construction assets, while the orange sunbursts represent our near-term or mid-development stage sites. The states shaded in blue represent locations where we have early stage development assets. During this presentation, Megan and I will be covering project overview, project goals, components of the project, construction process, project schedule, resource overview, and end with the Q&A. So starting us off will be on the project overview and location. Chuparosa Solar and Storage consists of a 300 megawatt PV solar and 300 megawatt battery energy storage facility approximately three miles of 34.5 kV collection lines and approximately a three and a half mile 500 kilovolt Gentile line to the Sugarloaf substation. We are applying for a right-of-way grant covering around 6,600 acres of BLM administered lands. There will be an additional 30 acres of private owned lands associated with the collection and Gentile lines needed for the project as well. The project area is approximately four miles south of the town of Holbrook, generally west of State Route 77. It is located near existing energy transmission infrastructure, such as several high voltage transmission lines and substations, and a large scale wind farm to the south of the site. The project would also be near a hog farm and feed mill. Project goals, uh, aside from bringing new jobs and sales tax revenue to Navajo County, the fundamental purpose of the project is to construct a clean, renewable source of solar electricity that helps meet the region's growing demand for power and helps fulfill national and state renewable energy and greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. 
Solar energy provides a sustainable, renewable source of power that helps reduce fossil fuel dependence and greenhouse gas emissions. Next up, the project components, construction processes, and requirements. Key components associated with the project include a PV solar energy generating system, a battery energy storage system, substation and Gentai lines, in infrastructure and ancillary facilities. The activities during the construction process will focus on solar panels, battery energy storage system, and other equipment. Those will be manufactured offsite and transported to the project site. Erosion and sediment control and pollution prevention plan, which will be prepared by a qualified engineer or erosion control specialist and implemented before and during the construction process or during construction once approved by BLM state hydrologists. Grading and vegetation management. The project will use a mode approach to minimize grading of the project area. To further highlight, one of the company's key goals is to minimize our grading activities on all sites and utilize the best technology and construction practices to help reduce our overall impact on ground disturbance at each of our project sites. Next process would be our construction staging areas. Uh, temporary staging areas would be established within the project boundaries for storing materials, construction equipment, and vehicles. O&M building, a new O&M facility would be completed constructed on site as well. Uh, Gentile line construction, primary stages in Gentile line construction are foundation installation, tower installation, and conductor stringing. Little to no grading is expected to be required in these areas. Whole foundations will be excavated to a depth of 30 feet, and the hole will be backfilled with concrete. Uh, road system construction, main access roads would be 20 to 30 feet wide. Interior access roads would be 20 feet wide and surface with gravel or compacted dirt. Existing roads would be utilized as much as feasible. Next up, some photos of existing access roads. The photo on the left is, in, exist, is of an existing access road in the project area paralleling the Apache roadway. The photo on the right shows another existing access road in the project area. From these, you can see minimal activity in the area aside from vehicle tracks. Project requirements for construction, key requirements during this phase would be on water use. So about 950 acre feet would be used for dust suppression. Water would be either obtained from a local purveyor or an on-site groundwater well. Workforce, on-site construction workforce would be around 350 workers per day with a maximum of 500 workers during peak construction times. Vehicles during construction, all equipment and materials for the project construction would be delivered by flatbed trailers and trucks. Heavy equipment would be used for localized grading, road development, and facility construction. Worker commuter vehicles will also be present on site. For traffic, all traffic would to and from the site would use Interstate 40 and State Route 77 to access the site. Coordination with BLM and local authorities would be needed to determine construction traffic routes and identify roads or bridges that may need to may need to be improved or avoided. Con coordination with Arizona DOT and Navajo County Highway Maintenance Department would be needed for trucks transporting oversized or overweight project components. Key requirements during the O&M phase will be on panel repairs, panel washing, and road and fence repairs. Those will be performed as needed. Preventative maintenance of on-site equipment, such as inverters and trackers, will be performed in accordance to the manufacturer's recommendation and guidelines. The Gentile line and route would be inspected and maintained as required. Overhead line components would be inspected for corrosion, equipment misalignment, loose fittings, and other mechanical problems. Water use would be substantially reduced during this time, down to about nine acre feet annually for panel washing and workforce facilities. Vehicles during this time will con primarily consist of pickup trucks, forklifts, and loaders uh, normally used for maintenance, water trucks and water trucks for panel washing. Large heavy haul transport equipment may be brought to the site infrequently for equipment repair or replacement as needed. Traffic and, sign and safety signage will be maintained as a part of the overall project operation. Moving on to project schedule. This slide, this slide shows the proposed project schedule and to where we are to date. Uh, Primergy filed the SF-299 application and the preliminary plan of development last year to the Stafford Field Office. We are currently in the variance process and target to complete it by late fall of this year if approved. If the variance request is approved, then we would begin baseline studies, preliminary plan of deployment updates, and NEPA during winter of this year through 2024 and target a construction start in 2025. 
We are currently targeting a commercial operation date for the project in late 2027. And next up, I'll hand it over to Megan to cover the resources portion of the presentation. Thank you, Christina. Uh, my name is Megan Dugan. I uh, am the planning director of Arizona for SWCA Environmental Consultants. And I have been supporting Primergy on this project as their uh, environmental consultant. So we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we're gonna provide an overview of the resources that have been uh, reviewed um, with a, a subset of them presented in more detail here. So those would include surface water, livestock grazing, land use, recreation, vegetation, wildlife, cultural resources, and then paleontology. Okay, go to the next slide, thank you. Um, here we're presenting a brief overview of the analyses that have been conducted thus far. As BLM uh, discussed earlier, we're at a very preliminary stage in project development and resource analysis has been conducted at a desktop level. So we've uh, started with a critical issues analysis, which is a desktop evaluation of um, a subset of potential resource issues and permits necessary, which include land use, the ecology of the area, water resources, visual resources, um, a, re a review of previous cultural studies and um, paleontology in the region. Uh, we have then also prepared a draft variance factors analysis report, which is available on ePlanning at the link that BLM provided. Um, this is a desktop evaluation of 22 uh, factors as described in the Western Solar Program um, programmatic EIS. Uh, in addition to the evaluation of those 22 factors, uh, we have also prepared four desktop level technical reports that go into more detail about potential resource issues. These have been prepared for both project specific, so project footprint uh, related biological resources, as well as regional biological resources, which look at larger um, considerations such as wildlife movement across the landscape. We've also prepared a class one cultural resources um, inventory, which is a uh, uh, inventory of previous surveys and previously recorded cultural resources uh, within the area of investigation. And then we have also prepared a paleontological resources technical memo. I will also note at this point that if uh, there are additional resources that we're not gonna discuss in detail um, in this presentation, those would include visual resources and soils. Uh, there are analyses for these those resources presented in the variance factors analysis report um, that, and we are more than happy to speak to those in more detail if you have additional questions um, or you're welcome to review the report and follow up with any questions. Uh, and again, that report is posted for public review. Um, and then if the variance is approved, uh, additional analyses and a high overview of potential future analyses that would be conducted during the pre-NEPA baseline study phase would include a biological evaluation, which would uh, evaluate potential impacts to threatened endangered candidate species, as well as BLM special status species. An aquatic resources delineation and hydrology studies would be conducted, as well as field-based cultural resource surveys, um, as well as preparation of a visual resources technical report that would involve field work and simulations of the proposed project. Um, and again, a number of additional studies would be uh, conducted as determined by the BLM and cooperating agencies. All right, thank you. So an overview of the surface water resources within the project area uh, is presented here. There are no natural perennial water sources um, present within the project area. Surface waters within this area consist of ephemeral drainages, also known as washes, uh, that generally flow to the north and um, northeast to the Little Colorado River. The nearest natural perennial water source is Silver Creek, which is located about approximately two miles east of the project area. Um, surface waters within the project area consist of earthen stock tanks, which are contain water in response to precipitation. There are also approximately 131 acres within the project area that have been mapped as uh, a zone A special flood hazard area. 
Um, and uh, in response to that, project design would avoid these 100 year floodplain areas. Thank you. Let's go to the next. Right. And this slide presents an overview of livestock grazing use uh, within the project area. So the project area is located within portions of five grazing allotments that are administered by the BLM and Arizona State Land Department. But the Aztec Land and Cattle Company also owns a large amount of private land in this area and conducts grazing activities out here. Um, BLM grazing regulations require that BLM notify permittees at least two years of advance of any proposed agency chain in, change in allotment in response to any management activities or changes in use. Um, in addition to that, we are aware that livestock grazing infrastructure has is present within the project area, and that does include um, cattle guards, corrals, fence lines, um, tanks, the earthen, earthen stock tanks, troughs, wells, et cetera, um, different infrastructure that is used to support grazing land use in this area. Um, Primergy would work with the BLM and affected allotment permittees to avoid impacts to improvements as part of project design and or discuss compensation. Um, if the variance is approved and the project goes through NEPA and is also approved. Um, and I will also note that for all of these resources that we discuss here, as well as other resources that are not included in this presentation, a detailed evaluation of potential impacts of the proposed project uh, would be conducted during the NEPA analysis. Again, if the variance is approved, that would be the next step. Thank you. All right. Uh, Christina presented a brief overview of different land uses that are present in the region. And uh, as you can see here, there's a map included in the presentation that shows the distribution of those in relation to the proposed project. The land status in this region is uh, a checkerboarded um, land ownership that uh, consists of BLM administered Arizona State Trust and privately owned lands, as you can see in the figure. Uh, the primary land use in this area is grazing, as well as energy generation and transmission. There are a number of high voltage transmission lines that uh, leave the Choya substation, which is located north of the project area in Holbrook, and carry electrical uh, energy to other parts of the state. There's also the Sugarloaf substation to which the project would interconnect located south of the project area directly adjacent to the Dry Lake Wind Farm, which is a utility scale wind energy facility located outside of the project area, but in close vicinity. Also, uh, we do have within the area the State Route 77, which you can see on the map, as well as the Apache Railway, which is a short line privately owned railroad that services uh, infrastructure or industries south of Holbrook and uh, down to Snowflake. Um, there are also, as Christina showed in pre in previously in the presentation, um, two track and other primitive roads accessing uh, the general area. And also as mentioned previously, there are agricultural operations in the area, including the Snowflake hog for operation and the Smithfield feed mill. And you can see those on the map as well. Okay. Right. Um, we would also like to present an overview of recreation use that occurs within this area. So the project area does not can, contain developed and or designated recreation sites and it's not located within an especially managed area for recreation. Recreational use in this area is generally low in uh, intensity and primarily dispersed. The types of recreation that occur in this area primarily include hunting, OHV use, hiking, and horseback riding, but other activities may also occur. The nearest designated recreation site is the Petrified Forest National Park located east of the project area. Um, okay, we'll go to the next. All right, an overview of vegetation within the project area um, consists of three different land cover classes. Those include semi-desert grassland, semi-desert shrub step, and salt desert scrub land cover. And you can see a representative photograph here on the slide. Uh, these land covers are ubiquitous across the region. Um, and as you can see in this photo, the uh, 
the landscape is generally flat to rolling uh, with some incised canyons located outside of the project area itself. There is one BLM special status plant species that may be present within the project area as it has been uh, documented in the general region and that is de brown leaf dune broom. Um, in addition, there is one noxious weed species known as camel thorn that is known to uh, be located and spreading within the general region and is certainly a plant species of concern that is being considered. Um, in terms of uh, potential project mitigation needs as if the variance application is approved. And again, as, as we've said before, um, and I'll just reiterate here, impacts to vegetation would be reduced to the greatest extent possible by minimizing the project footprint and implement implementation of design features, which also include the minimization of grading and other construction methods that Christina described earlier in the presentation. Um, if there would be impacts to special status plant species or concerns related to noxious weeds or sensitive vegetation communities, species specific and uh, species specific mitigation and monitoring strategies would be developed in coordination with the BLM and other agencies during the NEPA process. So an overview of wildlife and habitats within the project areas presented on this slide. Um, the figure you see here shows how the project area intersects two Apache Navajo County stakeholder identified diffuse wildlife movement areas. These wildlife movement areas have been identified as important for elk, mule deer, and pronghorn. We will also note here that Pronghorn is a species of concern in this region as uh, the population is somewhat geographically restricted and there may be fawning habitat and um, important foraging resources present in this region. Um, so that is certainly a species that is discussed in more detail in the technical reports that accompany the variance factor analysis report. The project area also contains suitable habitat for a candidate species for listing under the Endangered Species Act, the monarch butterfly. Monarch butterfly may occur pretty much anywhere across Arizona during migration and often winters in the lower desert. So the species may be present in the winter in during migration in the summer. Um, there is suitable habitat up in this area. Uh, the project area is also within the potential habitat the range for California condor. However, the species has not been documented east of Meteor Crater, which is located approximately 40 miles west of the project area um, historically. In addition, the project area is located within the Mexican wolf recovery area zone two. This is an area in which the species is allowed to naturally disperse and uh, it is known that wolves have been documented moving through this general region between different areas of habitat. Um, however, concentrated use has not been documented um, in the last, I think, 12 years. In addition to that, there are 11 BLM special status wildlife species, which includes the monarch butterfly, which is also a BLM special status species uh, that may occur within the project area. These species include bird species such as pinion jay, worst Western burrowing owl, ferruginous hawk, and golden eagle, um, as well as other species such as bat species and Gunnison's prairie dog. Um, as stated for vegetation, impacts to wildlife habitat, special status species, uh, species of concern, and movement corridors would be reduced to the greatest extent possible through coordination with Arizona Game and Fish, the BLM, US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and other cooperating agencies um, via implementation of design features, avoidance, minimization, and mitigation strategies. Species-specific surveys may be required during the pre-NEPA baseline data collection phase to better understand the distribution and abundance of, uh, and abundance of suitable habitats uh, within the project area to better inform the NEPA analysis, again, if the variance application is approved. Right. 
So we have an overview of cultural resources here. As stated earlier, when I was presenting the overview of the, the analyses conducted thus far, um, a class one cultural resources inventory was conducted for this project area. The results of that um, indicated that less than 2% of the project area has been previously surveyed. Some of these surveys may have occurred very far in the past and may no longer meet modern survey standards and therefore some of the previously surveyed areas may require additional survey. Again, during the pre-NEPA baseline um, data collection time. Of Within that 2% of the project area that's been surveyed, 23 archeological or historic sites have been identified. Um, two of them are pretty apparent on the landscape, one of which is the Apache Railway, which is the privately owned short line railway and State Route 77. 15 of the 23 sites have not been evaluated yet for their natural, Re national register of historic places eligibility. Six and six have been determined to be eligible by either the State Historic Preservation Office or the BOM. Uh, State Route 77, which is uh, noted as a historic resource, has segments with different eligibility determinations. Um, right now, initial consultation by the BLM with interested tribes is being conducted and will continue to occur through the rest of the remainder of the variance process and then in and through the NEPA process as uh, if the variance application is approved. Um, again, if the, if the application is approved, uh, a sampling and survey strategy would be developed in preparation for the NEPA process and additional surveys will need to be conducted. Um, if there is a potential for historical or cultural resources or areas of uh, concern identified by tribes during the section, during the consultation process, avoidance mitigation and monitoring strategies would be developed and would need to be implemented during construction. Right. And our final resource of um, in the presentation is paleontological resources. Within this, the region that the project area is located, there are there is a high potential for significant paleontological resources to be present. Um, these are associated with the Moncopi found formation. Um, the, this formation contains is uh, of the Paleo Triassic geologic age, which includes the um, major extinction event, and it contains a diverse invertebrate, a, di a diverse combination of invertebrate and vertebrate fossils. Um, this formation covers the majority of the project area as it does cover the majority of this region of Arizona. The remainder of the project area is, has what is considered low potential for significant paleontolo paleontological resources. This is Coconino sandstone, which uh, contains largely fossils of invertebrates um, from the Permian period. Um, the BLM would determine during the pre-NEPA baseline study period if additional field-based surveys would need to be conducted in preparation for NEPA. Again, as we've discussed for the other resources, if there's the potential for significant paleontological resources to be impacted, avoidance, mitigation, and monitoring strategies would be developed. Thank you. And now we would like to open it up for questions. Great, thank you, Megan and Christina. Um, yeah, so please, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand, um, type them in the chat. And now is the time. Go ahead and hit us with any burning thoughts or questions you may have. Well, maybe the presentation was just that good where we, we answered any questions anyone may have. All right, it looks like one came in from, from David Shrumway. Is the slide presentation available that we can download? Um, I believe we will be posting this on the e-planning website. And um, Clara had posted the link to e-planning in the chat. So 
It might take a little while for us to get everything on there, but we will have all of this information posted. All right, and we do have a hand raised. Um, Kent Flake, um, please feel free to come off mute and ask your question. What is the plans for how you're keeping, because we're livestock grazers around the area, what are the plans to keep cattle from disturbing the solar panels or anything like that? What, what plans do we have for that? Are they going to be raised high enough, the cattle will graze under them, or the loss of grazing use for those areas as well? Yeah, I can take that. Uh, we'll be ev evaluating the appropriate type of fencing. You know, we typically look for a balance of uh, wildlife friendly fencing along with uh, standard utility practice or standard utility required fencing. You know, at the end of the day, this is a um, generating facility. So we want to make sure that it's protected for uh, security, but also for the, the wildlife on the other side. Uh, so we'll, that'll be something that we'll be exploring as we proceed on post the variance process. Thank you for the questions. We have any any other questions out there? Let's see, Ron Flake put one in the chat. What type of compensation is there for allotment owners who lose use of a section? One of our range specialists wanna jump in or, or Ron, do you wanna respond to that? I'll, I'll respond to that. And then if um, Ryan or Becky, if I miss something, they can follow up. Um, the way that would work is if the, like we discussed in our permitting meeting that we had before in Snowflake, um, once the, if the project is determined to move forward, if it gets approval through headquarters to move forward, at that point, that's when the permittees would be issued their two-year notice. Um, at that point, the compensation, it, um, it'll be determined between the permittees and um, Primergy Energy. That's when discussions can start. They can start talking to each other. Um, and then the BLM, we stay out of the negotiations for any compensation between the the company and the permittees, but um, as for dollar amounts and that, you know, we don't have those, do we, we don't have those dollar amounts. Those are just um, negotiated between the permittee and Prim Primergy, and then they let us know what, what agreements that they may have come, um, that they may have come to. Did I miss anything, Ryan? No, I think that was pretty much everything that I also had understood regarding the matter. Um, I guess I did also want to touch on, um, I mean, there may be another part to that question. It's kind of a, a little bit vague, but um, whether or not there is, say, compensation for lost AUMs, because there is forage that the BLM wants or has been providing for livestock use. And if, if the um, the energy development is implemented, then some of those AUMs are, are then unavailable. So whether or not we compensate you for lost AUMs, I think the answer to that would be no. The bill would be reduced um, to, um, to reflect how many AUMs are then available on the grazing allotment. Um, the other thing too, I mean, just to bring this up is is the fact that, you know, it's it's the the ranchers who have the their range improvements out there. We issue the permits for these range improvements to be placed out there, whether whether it was cattle guards or fence lines or corrals or that sort of thing. 
And uh, while we, the BLM, stay out of the compensation between the energy company and the rancher for compensation for that sort of thing, this is a good time for you to step up and say, hey, you know what, I just, I just can't function. My operation doesn't work if, if this corral goes away, or my operation just cannot function if, if that fence goes away. You know, those sorts of, those sorts of things are important for us as an agency to know what we're considering um, this energy project as part of this variance process. So that's good. Then Ryan, kind of along those lines with, um, do we have any, like if the variance goes through, like, is it going to be that full section is going to be fenced off or is it just going to be a portion of it? You know, cause we'll lose the AUMs, which reduces the bill to the BLM, but also like, cause you can say, because if we have a corral on one of those sections, can that be pulled out um, where the primergy can't go into that or they have to replace it or whatever has to happen after that variance period. So how does that work for, how, what is, how do we know if it's going to affect us? We Because we don't know right now if it will affect us, it will be at what stage will we know that, hey, here's where they're going to fence off this section or this portion of a section or that, so. Very, very good question, Kent. And the, that is something that uh, I was also wondering. So probably a good question for Christina to answer is, uh, you know, we have these this map of giant blocks, the entire section blocked off, but during the presentation, I did hear that you were going to try and reduce the footprint as much as possible while still um, getting as much energy use out of it as you can. So when, Christina, are we going to know exactly where the fence, fences or the installation would be put? Yeah, so once and if the variance is approved, that'll give us the green light to begin our baseline studies and site surveys so we can actually see what type of uh, site conditions we're working with. Um, and through our design optimization process, that's when we would really look and see, okay, how what footprint is usable for us? What can we maneuver around if we need to leave any infrastructure in place? Um, and, and kind of do a little bit more detailed uh, site review at that time. So. Okay. And, and another one for you, Christina, and you maybe already said this, but uh, as a reminder for all of us, you know, we have uh, a huge number of acres that are mapped as variance, variance area that you're considering for the project, but uh, to get the number of, of uh, megawatts or whatever out of your project, only a portion of that is necessary. I, and I forget, is it about, is it like half of that entire area would be required in order to, or is it like a quarter of that entire area would be needed? Yeah, typically rule of thumb is um, right around eight acres a megawatt uh, that we need. Uh, we're looking at a 300 megawatt facility, so roughly just under 2,500 acres. Uh, that's again, usable acres. So we wanna make sure it's clear of as many site constraints and avoid any, uh, any unnecessary impacts to the area that we have, that we can. So that's roughly a right around this, the size that we look to reduce, to reduce it down to. But again, that's after doing all of our site surveys and, and our diligence period, making sure that those are a good intact 2,500 acres that we can use for the project. Good, good, I understand. Yeah, definitely don't know the exact location yet. We'd have to do site review. Kent, did that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Maybe just one follow-up question, kind of based on that last one you said, Ryan. Is there the ability, after, so you guys do your initial site review, like you you have all of these sections that you've blocked out that you can use. You guys come back, you say, hey, I want 2,500 acres that I'm going to put um, infrastructure on. And then you take, like, do you have the ability in the future to build on that in later years to increase because you've got the variance at that time. Does the variance carry forward after the construction is complete or do you have to go through a new, like you basically get what you do after your site survey and go through the process saying, hey, here's what we are actually going to use. And then in the future, if you want to expand, you can, or do you have to go through the whole process again? I might be able to, um respond to that a little bit. So 
if and when this project were to go into NEPA, that's where we would take a deeper dive, um, you know, looking at potential resource impacts and through that whole NEPA process um, is, is where a lot of, of questions will be answered. And at the end of that, when a decision is made, that's when a, a right-of-way grant will be issued and, and that grant will determine exactly um, what areas would be able for, um, or would be authorized for solar development. Did that help answer your question? And so, so and just, and just to follow up what Selena said, yes, the whole 6,000 acres may be evaluated you know, once they once they start doing their baseline studies and then they start um, developing layouts and they start reducing it, you know, um, their, their footprint would be smaller. Um, the one thing, just because they evaluated the 6,300 acres doesn't um, say that, they're, that they can just go ahead and start developing it right away. You know, they would have to apply for another right away or amendment to their existing right away, which would, have to have some type of evaluation again on on those portions that are outside of the existing right away. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Sounds like um, Ron, if you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Yeah, how are you? Um, you. And obvious, obviously one of the uh, BLM's purposes is multi-use, um, you know, according to what's available and what the situation is. I know you touched on what re recreation there is, but um, which is not a huge amount at this point in here. I'll, I recognize that, but it, you know, I guess my concern is putting solar on something like this, it eliminates any other use. And, you know, with grazing, we can still have hunters come out, you know, we can still do different things, but um, I guess that's my concern is where's the, and obviously the BLM has concerns and goals with um, renewable energy sources and different things too, which things, but that in my quest, I guess that's why, why is it when something like that happens that it, it's going to eliminate anything else for anyone anyone else to, to use that that land. Well, you do make a good point, Ron. I'm, it definitely makes it a little more challenging to have you know multiple uses where uh, where panels are are placed on the land, and um, you know we just we just do our best to work with proponents to try to you know have a design that allows for as much multiple use as possible, but you are correct. It is a challenge to have multiple use where, you know, there's solar panels and potentially fenced off. Um, and, and those are things yeah. that will be evaluated if it, make, if it does move forward, you know, in um, during the NEPA process to um, evaluate, you know, not only cultural and all that, but, you know, all the multiple use and, so those are things that will be coming up throughout the whole project and, you know, can um, weigh in on the decisions that may be made, you know, with the project. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, have you guys even been out and done site stuff with topography or anything, or is that just been what you can view online? No, we've been out to the site a couple of times as, long, as well as our consultant there and, and taking some photos around the peripheral, but again, to be able to be granted access, we need to, to clear variance and begin the proper official process. Um, you know, one more thing, just on our on our ranch, our allotment that we've used, we've, um, uh, I'm gonna say it's been at least 40 years now, 43 years, I think we, we actually set up a rotational grazing system. We've got 40 plus years of records of you know, our conservation efforts to really help protect the, the grazing thing is, is anything like that going to be taken into consideration on, you know, what, what ranchers have done or what types of efforts they've made to, uh, to, you know, take care of the land that they had in their stewardship. And uh, I don't know, I'm just 
throwing that out there too, because I know, I don't know, every rancher, obviously, they have a vested interest to keep things up and going to the best of their ability. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I just, is, some, is anything like that going to be taken into consideration on this decision as well? Yeah, we're happy to learn more about those efforts, Ron, and those initiatives uh, during the time once the variant is approved and we are given the green light to have those discussions with you guys. Uh, we'd be more than happy to, to learn more about those uh, initiatives that you've been implementing in, on your grazing allotments. And I, I would jump in and say also, not only ask you about it and find out about it, but uh, probably also work with you to see how you can keep on implementing your rotational grazing system and still have a viable ranching operation out there. I think that would be the main goal also of the BLM is to continue the multiple use as best we can. Absolutely. Um, Yes, thank one, you, Ryan. One, one more question. Sorry, I'll let anyone else wants to jump in. Go ahead. <laughs> um, what now my mind went blank here. Um, what? Uh, ah, go ahead, someone else. I gotta come back to it. I had it right at the tip of my tongue. So. There, there is a, a question that was put in the chat. I don't want to lose sight of that, but Kent asked, what type of compensation does BLM get from Primergy for allowing single use? So Ron, can you maybe talk about like um, fees associated with right of way grants? Um, the only compensation the BLM gets out of the whole deal is the, the annual rent from from the from the project, whatever, how many acres or where their megawatts. Um, there's a there's a scale. There's a rent factor that they would calculate what that rent is for the project, and then. Um, and that's the only compensation the the BLM would get from Primergy. It's no different than right now, the rent that's paid by um, Avangrid for the wind the wind farm out there you know, on the BLM lands that are affected by um, the wind farm. There's a there, there's usually a rent based with those, and that's the only thing that we compensation that we would get out of the deal. And so what is the incentive, I guess, maybe that's what I'm not understanding. What incentive do we have, does BLM have to allow solar on here, on any of their property? If there's no material gain for the BLM. It, it, it's a use that has to be evaluated as um, um, any right of way, whether it's a road, renewable energy, transmission, if someone applies for a right away within BLM, we evaluate it. Um, solar has a little different um, use where, um, you know, right now, you know, the push is to um, for renewable energy from Washington for those areas. Um, so we 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 do accept the application to review it, um, and then also um, right now the, through the solar PEIS. We have to evaluate it through the variance process, and it's kind of like a vetting deal to see if there's any, like, real huge red flags or anything that could really um, stop the project um, and not move it forward. Um, but also that it informs the the decision makers on what's out there that we know of at this time. Um, but it's it's a use that. Um, that we have to accept the application and um, re and review it. Okay. Yeah. Right now we have um, certain goals um, that you know the agency because um, this administration has set certain goals for us to meet um, in terms of renewable energy and trying to um, address the the climate um, climate crisis. Yeah. And, and you know and, and I. And I'll let you know there's no predetermined decision that has been made to move this project forward or not. This is just a process we have to go through and um, evaluate it. And then at the point of the decision is made at um, the Washington level to either move forward or that, then it still needs to go through the whole um, 
environmental process of NEPA to see if it's um, even feasible to, to do. And so ultimately it's federal that decides the decisions then? Pardon me? I, I, it, it's in Washington that they ultimately decide if it's a go or no? Eventually that's where the decision will be made based on whatever recommendations are um, and stuff that are coming from um, from the um, from this meeting and our variance report and um, and that so that's where the decision will be made. Okay. Thank so you. I mean, if you want to, you, you can get online and at the end of this presentation, we'll give you an email address. You can um, make any comments you want and submit them to us too. To um, that way, they they're put into our um, our presentations. Okay, thank you. There Sam, was another, sorry, Ron, go ahead. Sam's had his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed a raise. Go ahead. Hand. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, so I'm Sam, I'm brother to Ron and Kent. I've been ranching out there for many years. And um, just a couple comments and a question as well is, oh, we're actually fifth generation ranchers. Our ancestors um, came and tamed this land years ago, and and it's I don't know, it's it's sentimental as well as you know how everything could affect. And I've also got three boys and a daughter that we've we've, we've worked out there, and and you know hoping it could be a sixth generation, and and just to be straight honest, like. Seeing that, seeing it come on the land saddens me, um, and you know as well as all the like the grazing and different things it could take away. But um, I did want to add what Ron was saying that as far as helping the the wildlife and things like that. Recently, well, a couple of years ago, we spent thirty thousand dollars for to to increase the stock tank capacity of about ten tanks that are out there. Which helps the antelope and a lot of the, the wildlife out there. Um, the question, the question I had was one thing that kind of confused me. Want a little more clarification on was 350, one about 350 workers a day coming out there. Um, that I'm trying to understand why so many people are going to be working out there at once, and I'm and I'm trying to, you know, imagine what that'll do, and you know with 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 us and us going out there to take to take care of the cattle to work them and and uh take supplement out to them and things like that and i wonder if you could address that yeah so during the throughout construction there'll be various areas of activity however we can develop um in our traffic plan or kind of our our overall plan on areas of of entrance to the facility or to the sites while they're working on those uh, on those parts of the site, as well as the, some of the staging and laydown yards uh, to minimize any impacts for neighboring operations. So that way it'll, it will try to work with you guys in terms of minimizing any of your day-to-day your -day activities in the surrounding areas. Um, that workforce will come from, you know, some of the neighboring towns um, will most likely end up working normal uh, business hours Monday through Friday. Don't believe we pull any weekend shifts. So it'll be primarily limited to standard working hours. Um, and be able to, and we'll be able to coordinate some of those um, those daily trips, if you will, uh, with BLM and put those on file. The other, the, the other thing that would happen too is if it ever did go that far and they were granted a right of way for the project, there would um, be stipulations within their right of way grants that um, would be used to help minimize um, impacts to the to the land. You know and um, that they would have to follow. And surrounding uses, yeah. And I guess just one more concern I have is with with the maintained roads, you know, the better roads, everything's going out there and um, cattle guards, things like that, that could increase the, the number of people that come out, um, maybe not necessarily to do good, you know, and, and you know, because it's so much easier to access by that point. So that's, that's another concern I have. 
Um, the, like the installation of cattle guards and, and all that, those are things that would be analyzed during the environmental process to see if they're needed or not. Um, you know, um, if roads need to be improved during construction, there may be re rehabilitation um, stipulations for them to take them back to a certain aspect at the end of the project. It just depends on, on what they are. Um, and then um, if they're going to be, if they are going to be uh, putting, installing cattle guards, that's something that they would have to disclose during the analysis portion of it and show us where their goals are and why they're, they're doing them, so. Um, one more for me. Um, and I don't know if you can answer this at this point, but I mean, is there future plans to move on to state land sections? You know, I mean, obviously BLM sections are probably the most stringent requirements and what you can do. And I feel like if something gets approved on a BLM section, the state land section's gonna almost rubber stamp it because their requirements aren't quite as difficult or as hard. You know, a um, majority of us allotment owners have a mixed bag of some private, some state, some BLM. And, you know, for me, that's almost half my ranch the state and BLM and so if this gets approved you know I just look that the you know down the road and it might not be 10 or 15 10 or 12 years but ultimately still with potential to put us out of business and doing things is there plans at this point to move forward on other um, public lands uh, for this project at this time, um, Primer G and a study consultant have been in discussions with some of the neighboring private landowners in an effort to backfill some of the checkerboard where applicable um, and where uh, site constraints aren't, or site constraints match, excuse me, site constraints aren't as present to what we find on the BLM sites or the BLM administered lands. Um, incorporating that private land instead of Arizona state land uh, will help reduce the dependency on on the BLM administered lands and in an effort to make help make our project shape a little bit more contiguous. Um, we do anticipate uh, also working with that consult, uh, our siting consultant, seeing ways of optimizing our crossings um, and limiting the amount of impact uh, by those additional crossings needed to connect some of those parcels. So at this point, I think we're primarily focusing on BLM and private um, with Arizona State as a, as a backup potential. But at this stage, like you mentioned, it's fairly early. So we're still considering all approaches and all easement um, directions at this point. David Shemai has a couple of questions in the chat too. I don't know if you've seen those. Yeah, I did notice those. I'll go ahead and, and read through those real quick. Um, first question, if the project is approved as proposed, it will put me out of business as a cattle grazer rancher because of the area included my grazing, because of the area included my grazing allotment. Is there any consideration for the economic impact to me and my family that has ranched here for the past 30 years? I know we kind of touched on that earlier. Ryan, did, did you wanna maybe fill that one and respond to it? I'm not sure what else I can say other than the fact that we are a multiple use agency and I, I don't know. I, I feel bad. If things were to happen that would put people out of business, then that's definitely not what we want to have happen. We're trying to just figure out how we can uh, have multiple use on, on these public lands. These public lands are, you know, they're, they're owned by me and you both. We just happen to be the BLM, the, the agency that manages the use of that land. So we're, we're trying to take all the consideration of the public because it's your land. Um, and this is definitely a consideration. So when we write an environmental assessment, we do the NEPA for this. This kind of comment is, is very important to say, hey, these are the economic impacts uh, to this, this group of people. And that is considered, yes. So David, yes, we do take it into consideration. Um, that's not what we base our entire decision on, but it is a part of it. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Um, and yes, no, but, uh, you know, of course, BLM and, and I'm sure the proponent does not want to see anybody put out of business. So 
um, if this project were to make it through variance and go on to NEPA, like Ryan said, um, all of this input um, will be very, very important to that NEPA process. Um, next and, question. And, and oh, just to go sorry. back to that too, just real quick, you know, if it does make it, does get approval, th this meeting today is just not the only day that you will have um, time to participate in it. You know, once, if it does make it to meet NEPA, once we start that and we start the environmental process, um, there will be some public scoping uh, meetings for the public to get involved in and comment. And so this isn't the only time you, you would be able to comment. Um, if it does make it that far, there'll be other um, times where the public would be able to make um, comments on the project. Absolutely. Um, the next question from David uh, says, the current uses of the land preserve the ecology under the stewardship of the ranchers, but industrial solar will unavoidably alter and harm the site ecology forever. How can this be justified? So I, I don't know who, who wants to speak to that. Would you want to talk a little bit about your practices, Christina, and then, and then I can follow up? Sure. Um, as I mentioned before in the construction slide, we really do try to work with as much of the natural topography as possible instead of just, you know, old older practices for solar. We're just completely coming in, leveling and removing any sort of natural uh, grow from the property. Um, for us and all, some of our projects that we're working on, and also in the Southwest, we leave as much natural vegetation. We have a really aggressive uh, vegetation and management plan for some of those projects that we are hoping to carry over here, if it makes sense. Um, you know, obviously you need to do more, do di more diligence and site-specific surveys here to go into those mitigation plans, but um, we really do try to work with as with the existing terrain as much as possible and try to minimize our impacts to the site all around, not just, um, you know, just not just the ground, but the, uh, take a more holistic approach with the, the site and its community. And the one thing, if it does move forward, um, Primergy would be tasked with, you know, a bunch of um, due diligence stuff at the beginning, you know, studies, um, finalizing their POD with um, ways that they would develop the area. Um, you know, they've had their discussions of, you know, they're, they're trying to not come in and just flat blade everything. You know, they're trying to work with the topography and, and the vegetation in the area. So um, those are things that, that they would uh, put in their final POD for us to consider and be evaluated during the environmental process. Um, with that, if we see things that um, they could affect the ecology or whatever, there, there may be best management practices that the BLM would um, put as stipulations within their right-of-way grant that they would have to do. And to add on to that, if, if, if the project did move forward, got through NEPA and ended up um, you know, getting issued a notice to proceed for construction, they would also have to provide a reclamation and restoration plan for how they're gonna restore the land um, at the end of, of their right-of-way grant. And with, and if, ever, if it ever made it that far, you know, they have the restoration and reclamation plan. Um, the other thing that they would have to provide is a bond to make sure that that reclamation is completed. Um, according to what was um, what was submitted and, and um, approved. All right, thank you guys for these questions. This is really good information. Um, let's see, we just had one more come in from Kent Flake. Can you clarify for when we have time to comment and give our input? We have the next 30 days for an initial comment period, what other times do we have to get our voices heard? I don't understand the full process. Thank you, Kent, for, for asking that question. You do have 30 days. Um, there are, are several different ways for you to get your comments in and your voice heard. Um, thank you. Uh, this is what I wanted to make sure you guys have is you can send questions, comments through email. Um, you can send them through 
through postal mail to, to the Safford Field Office. The address is right there. And we also have the e-planning website um, that was dropped in the chat earlier. And Ron, they can, they can post any questions and comments on e-planning as well, correct? Not in e-planning, but they can get the uh, email address out of there and uh, okay. also my mailing address. Uh, my, the email to send the comments to is blm underscore a A Z underscore S F O underscore solar at blm.gov. Um, and we will take those comments. Um, to also follow up on Selena's comment to Kent, yes, you do have 30 days to comment on um, this um, this meeting. And then the next um, time that the um, that we'd be working with the permittees would be if it ever if it did get approved and it moves into the moves forward into the um NEP, the NEPA portion of it um I, to give you kind of like a timeline after this meeting and our comment period we're probably looking at possibly compiling everything and having a presentation to our state director uh, probably sometime in October, uh, early November, possibly somewhere around in there. They, um, and then um, if he moves it forward up to Washington at that point, you know, and then, then it'll be up to them to make a decision. So we probably wouldn't see any decision on this um, December, January of this, December of this year, January of next year. And I just wanted to point out that that email address to submit comments was dropped in the chat. Um, thank you, Clara, for putting that there. And the slide that you see, it, it does have a deadline of August 18th, but I, I believe that might fall um, just before the weekend. So we did extend that to August 21st. So you, you actually have until August 21st to submit um, questions or comments for the variance um, process. And like Ron said, if, if that did proceed into NEPA, then of course there's there's a whole other scoping um, time frame that that'll come later on for um, the NEPA portion. But for the variance, you do have until August 21st. Um, yeah, so please, if if you think about anything, uh, I do appreciate all the comments that came in tonight. But you know, if you think about something over the next few weeks, um, by all means, please uh, send in your questions. And, and just to, uh, just to let you guys know, this is our third meeting today. Our first one was with, with the tribes. We've met with them already. Um, and then the agency meeting we had earlier today was with um, like Game and Fish and Fish and Wildlife Services, um, Army Corps of Engineers, um, the, the government agencies. And then this is our third meeting today. So everybody will have um, that 30 days to comment, which actually is 30 days plus three days. So it's um, the 21st. Someone asked earlier, will we uh, be uploading the slide presentation to somewhere where they can get it? Um, yes, after this meeting, we'll submit this to our public affairs office. They will um, convert it, um, this presentation to uh, like a YouTube um, channel and I will, I will upload that as soon as it's available. I will upload that up to um, e-planning and anybody can, that missed the meeting can, um, can, can watch the meeting and um, then they can make comments based on whatever they, the information they got out of the meeting. I will also be uploading the slide presentation too. I have, do have a copy of that and I'll be putting that in there too. So um, when you go into e-planning, you'll find the project, the link will take you right to the project. And then on the left hand side, there'll be documents and maps and there'll be, you'll see the maps and then you can click on the documents and that'll have um, all the documents that'll have this presentation. Um, there'll be the slideshow right now up in there. There is the draft plan of development that was submitted back last year. And then there's also the last, um, the updated uh, what's called the Variance Feasibility Analysis Report. You can re review that if you want, it's in there. Um, so, and then you can just you know, make comments. 
Um, David put another question. Can I submit pictures that may demonstrate unsuitability of specific sites proposed? Absolutely, David. Feel free to, to submit, you know, attach any pictures that you think could be helpful. All right, I don't see any hands raised. Um, don't see any other questions entered in the chat. So please, last call, if you guys have any other questions. Uh, I know we're kind of running short on time, but um, we will take a few more questions if anyone has any. Um, and, and again, if, if you need some time to sleep on it or think about it, you always have time, um, 30 days to ask any other questions you may have. Again, thank you guys for your time tonight. Appreciate it. See any hands coming up? No other questions. So yes, thank you all. Appreciate your attendance. And um, yeah, appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.